Amen and amen. Thank you, my brothers. God bless you all. Thank you, Randy, John, Chris. Thank you. It's good to see Todd and Ann Steenbergen with us this morning. We revised, it's been a while, but we revised the old Tick Ridge Boys, of which Todd was a part of those early singing days. And uh, some days we want to forget, other days we want to celebrate. And uh, we're grateful. Todd and Ann served with us for about 10 years. And had they been of us, they would have remained with us. Uh, but uh, they went on in God's leadership and other places of service. But our hearts are, are, are knitly tied with this family and so grateful for them. I invite you to turn with me this morning if you have a copy of God's Word to the, to the epistle of 1 John near the back of your Bible. You have 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then Jude, and then the Revelation. John, uh, the disciple of Jesus, is responsible for 1, 2, and 3 John, the Revelation, as well as the Gospel of John. He was the disciple that Jesus loved, and God inspired him to write this letter to the churches of Ephesus and other believers to encourage them in their faith. And we've already begun looking through chapter 1. We now find ourselves in chapter 3 at verse number, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 3 through 11. If you don't have a Bible with you today but would like to read along with us, there should be a blue Bible in the book rack in front of you. You're welcome to use that Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take that home with you as our gift to you as well. So I want you to notice with me in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And if you're there, would you say amen? The scripture says, by this we know that we know him. I believe it's a very powerful truth that God wants us to know something, right? He said, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and his truth or the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's pray together just a moment. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you how you've already communicated to our other congregations that have met earlier today. I pray now, Father, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit has to say. Give us minds that will be alert and, and, and ready to receive uh, the word of God. And then, Father, transform us by the power of this gospel. We love you, Lord. We praise you. Help me today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We've been taking time to go through this little book to learn several great truths. We studied a few weeks ago in chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Uh, we studied about the identity of the Savior. And you'll look there in verse 1 and 2 that Jesus is identified as the word of life. He's not only the one who speaks life to us, but he's the one who brings life to us in his very person. And then we began looking at chapter 1, verse 5 and following, and John presented a very strong case that even though we're saved by God's grace, we belong to him, there are still times that we may sin in our journey. If anybody says he does not sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. And the good news, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, that even if we were to stumble in our sin... Uh, the Bible tells us that God has given us an advocate. He's given us an atonement, a propitiation for our sins, which is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And now we come to verse number three of chapter two, and we begin to study and see that there is the certainty of our salvation. I believe God wants us to know that we are saved and that we belong to him. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to go to a man's house. God had been dealing with his heart. He seemed to be ready to be saved. And his wife asked me if I would come talk to him. His name was Mike. I said, I'd be glad to. He's out toward Edmonton. And I, they welcomed me in their home. And I sat down and I began to talk with Mike. And it was obvious he was serious. He was sincere about wanting to be saved. And I shared a couple passages of scriptures just to strengthen his faith. And then we got on our knees, knowing, and we began to pray. And uh, he prayed, asking God to forgive him 
him of his sin, to come into his heart and life. And when we got done praying, I looked at him and I said, Mike, has the Lord saved you? And he never acknowledged. He kind of shook his head no. I said, well, let's, let's just pray again. Let's just ask the Lord to do this. And we prayed again and he prayed his prayer. And I asked him, Mike, has the Lord saved you? He said, no. He, was, he seemed so serious. He seemed so sincere. But he had a hard time of being sure. And so I tried to do my best to try to encourage him and help him. And while, while my motives were right, my methods may not have been right. Because here's what I've come to discover. Only God can give somebody the confirmation of salvation. Nobody can tell another person, you're saved, and this is, you know it. You may not know it, but you are. That only comes by the power and the revelation of God himself. And so what I want to talk about a little bit while this morning is this. I, I, I hope that everybody can leave church this morning that you can say with bold, confident uh, a conviction, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I hope you can say that from the depth of your soul and know that you know that you know that you know that you belong to him. Adrian Rogers probably put it best when he said that eternity is too long to be wrong. You don't want to be wrong about this. You can be wrong about a lot of things and be okay, but you better not be wrong about this thing called salvation. So let's talk about two things that surface out of this text because I believe that what John does for us in this text is he brings us to a place where he wants us to know the truth. In fact, John places a great emphasis on this. First of all, if you're taking notes, jot this one thought down, and that is, first of all, you can know that you are saved. You can know. I've had some people tell me you just won't know till you get there. Well, that's not true according to the record of God's word. You are able to know whether you're saved or not. In fact, John here in the text places a great emphasis on knowing. In fact, I want to draw your attention to something here. And if you've got a paper Bible or a paper a hard copy, then you can follow this very quickly. Look at chapter 2, verse 3. John says in verse 3, by this we know that we know him. Look at verse number 5. He says, by this we know that we are in him. Go a little further in chapter number 2. Look at verse number 18. He says, by which we know that at the last hour. Look in chapter number 3, verse number 2. He says, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Look in chapter 3, verse number 14. He says, we know that we have passed from death to life. Verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. Look at verse 19, by this we know that we are of the truth. Verse 24, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given to us. Chapter 4, verse 6, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Look at verse number 13, by this we know that we abide in him. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God. Chapter 5, verse number 13. He says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions from which we have asked of him. Verse number 18. We know know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Verse 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. You cannot read the little epistle of John without recognizing that he's telling us that, it's, that we are capable of knowing some things. This is not, this is not a fog, this is not wishful things. Thinking. This thing called knowing Christ, knowing God, clearly John tells us we can know Him. Now there are basically two ways that a person can come to know something. First of all, somebody can come to know something intellectually. If you will do research, if you'll study, if you'll read, you'll come to know a lot about a certain thing or a certain person. But you know as well as I do, there's a great difference between knowing a lot about somebody and knowing somebody personally. He's not interested in simply filling our head with information. What God really wants to do is fill my heart so it leads to transformation. A lot of people have 
a lot of knowledge about the Bible and about church and about how we do things, but the reality is their head is full, but their heart is empty. So you can know some things intellectually. But what John is emphasizing in the text is not us knowing the Lord intellectually, but knowing Him experientially. That's what verse number 3, the very first word know, means. By this we know. It is in the present tense. This is how God designed it, so that we would know that we are saved, that we have Christ living in our heart. Now here, let me help you understand it, what it means to know the Lord experientially. There are some things in life you can never know unless you experience it personally or experientially. Give you a couple of illustrations. A woman will try to explain to a man what labor and delivery feels like. You know as well as I do, she'll talk all day. But unless you're a mama and have gone through that process, you cannot explain to someone else what that's like. Carol Burnett, the old comedian, said that if you want to explain to a man what labor and delivery, delivery is like, then tell him to take his bottom lip and pull it up, up over his head, and then he might understand what you're talking about. If you've never gone through it, no amount of explanation can make it plain to you. You think about a person who's gone to war, and they've, they've been in the thick of war, not simply over there, but the bullets have been going past their head. They've seen buddies killed and blown up in front of them, and for them to come back and explain to you and I what war is like, we'll never understand that because we've never experienced it. There are some things in life that you have to experience for yourself. A family that goes through the tragedy of losing a child or losing a baby and, and they stand at the casket of their loved one and don't you dare come up to them and tell them you know what they feel like and what they're going through unless you have experienced that same thing. Does that make sense to you? This word here, when he says that we can know him, he's talking about knowing the Lord experientially. The coming to know the Lord doesn't happen because someone has explained it to you as much as you have experienced experienced it personally. And so he says, this is how we know by personal experience that we know him. The second word know in verse number three is also the same Greek word, but it's a different Greek text or tense. The first Greek word is a present tense, which means it's ongoing. But the second word is in the perfect tense. Anytime you find a Greek verb in a, in a, in a perfect tense, it means that it is a completed action never needing to be completed again, but it has ongoing results. Help you understand it from this regard. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died for our sins. That's in the perfect tense. It's a completed action in the past that never needs to be completed, but it has continuing results. Does that make sense to you? And when the Bible says that you and I know, for me, it was the spring of 1978, Jesus saved me. He didn't need to save me then, then save me again later then save me again down the road. His salvation was good the first time, but because it was so good the first time, what he did the first time, still good at this time. And so he says, this is the way that we know him. We have experienced him. And then this word know, and the second word, it means to have a settled knowledge, a settled assurance. Maybe somebody would put it this way. How do you know when you're in love? And your response often would be, you just know. You just know it. You can't hardly explain it. You just know it. And when someone says, how do you really know that you're saved? Those who have been saved, they may have a hard time explaining it, but they just simply say, man, when the Lord saves you, you know that he has saved you by his grace. I want to say unapologetically to you this morning, salvation is an experience. God has made us creatures of emotion, and through our emotions we experience this thing called salvation. And I'm glad that it is an experience. But now let me bring you to my second point of the message this morning. Because we're trying to talk about knowing whether we're saved or not. And clearly the Bible teaches us this morning that you can know whether you're saved or not. But here's the second thing. You can also know, you can also be sure you're saved. Now, the reason I make this emphasis is this reason, is while my emotions are a part of my salvation encounter with God, it is not my emotions that prove to me that I'm saved. 
A lot of people will say, how, where are you saved? Yes, I am saved. Well, how do you know you're saved? Man, I felt it all over me. Man, I just felt it. How many of you know your feelings can lie to you? Your feelings can make you feel. That's why if some of the people feel saved one day and they don't feel saved the next day, it's because they're being led by their emotions rather than being led by the Word of God. So here's what John does in the text for us today. John knows that the assurance of our salvation is not based on subjective feelings, but the assurance of our salvation is based on objective truth, truth that can be measured. And so what he says, there are two things that mark and measure out who true believers are. Now watch this. I don't know your heart and you don't know my heart, but I will tell you that what's in the heart comes out in the life, doesn't it? What's in the heart comes out through my mouth. And so while we don't know each other's heart, we do have the liberty to see each other's lives and by looking at a person's life you're able to tell whether or not they are followers of Jesus Christ they may say they are followers but it's not what comes out of the lips that proves their salvation it's what comes out of their life that proves their salvation in fact let me show it to you right here in the text of scripture if I want the assurance of my salvation, then first of all, we will know we are saved by the life that we live. Look at here. What kind of life does a believer live? He or she lives a life by keeping the commandments of God. He says this for us in verse number 3. What's neat about preaching the word, watch this. What's neat about preaching the word is that I don't have to interject my thoughts and my thought feelings. All I have to do is say this is what God's word says. And then all of us have to measure our life against the standard of God's word. This is not man's opinion, but rather this is God's word that comes to us. Verse number 3, 4, and 5 says this. Watch this. This is a powerful truth from the inspired pen of the apostle John. He says, now by this we know God experientially and we know him with great assurance because we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Now there's a lot in here. You'll notice in these three verses, the word keep has surfaced, right? He will keep his commandments. The word keep there has the idea of a soldier or a sentry who is parading back and forth on the top on a wall, watching over for an enemy that might attack a city. He's watching, he's vigilant, he's sober, he's serious. You know what John is saying about a Christian? A man or woman who is truly saved not only believes the Bible, but seeks to live by biblical principle. Can I make that comment again? We live in a culture and in a community where everybody said they got saved, but nobody's really living for the Lord, or very few are. The Bible teaches us that those who are genuinely saved not only believe the Bible, but seek to live according to biblical principle. Now, notice what he says in verse 3, 4, and 5. He is not saying in these verses that you and I who are Christians live perfectly. His emphasis, watch this, his emphasis is not on perfection, but on direction. What direction is your life going toward? If you're living a life that's seeking to live by God's word, that doesn't mean that you won't stumble in your faith. We know that to be true because we read 1 John chapter 1. We all still stumble in our faith. We recognize that. But the totality of our life is not marked by constant rebellion, but the totality of our life is marked by our continual desire to do and live according to God's word. If you understand that, say amen. That's kind of weak, so let me help you with this a little bit more, can I? Let's suppose you're, going, you're, you're in Cave City, Kentucky, and I'm driving on the interstate. I'm traveling on I-65 going south, and I pick you up in Cave City, Kentucky, and we start driving toward Nashville. You say, where are you headed to? I said, I'm going to Louisville, Kentucky. You'd look strange at me because if you knew anything about I-65, you would know that if I was going to Louisville, I shouldn't be traveling south. I ought to be traveling north. And you might say, well, you need to turn around. And if I turn around, I may start traveling north on I-65. I'll, in, in, uh, I'll stop in Glendale to get me a hamburger or something. And then I'll get hungry and stop again in E-Town. Amen. And I'll get a drink there. And then I'll stop up at Shepherdsville because there's a long distance between E-Town and Shepherdsville. And I'll get some snack there to try to wash my hamburger down, right? Now, there will be times that I'll be heading up north that I might get off the main road from time 
time to time, but I'm heading in the right direction. Do you see where I'm going with this? How do you know who's saved? Some people say, I'm saved, but everything in their life shows you that they're going away from God and not going to God. And so John says, how do you know you're saved? One mark of being saved is you take the word of God seriously and you seek to apply its principles to your daily life. Sometimes you may veer off the path that God has prescribed, but the fact that you're headed toward heaven, you're seeking to serve and do what the Lord's called you to do. Let me help you with this a little bit further. Spurgeon makes this observation for us this morning. Spurgeon declares in this, in this truth, an unchanged life is a sign of an uncleansed heart. Paul would say it this way in Romans, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are what? Passed away, behold, all things are become new. The Bible doesn't teach that we don't sin, that we don't struggle. That's a reality. We know that. But the life of a believer is not marked by constant rebellion. The life of a believer is marked by a desire to serve and be obedient to God. D.L. Moody tells the story. There was a drunk man one day who staggered up to him, clearly inebriated. And Moody looked at him and the man said to Moody, he said, do you remember me? Moody said, sir, I'm sorry, I do not remember you. He said, you ought to remember me. You saved me at one of your crusades. Moody looked at him and said, you look like somebody I saved. Amen. Said, if the Lord saved you, he would have changed you by now. And I'll tell you that if you've ever tasted heavenly honey, your heart has been touched by the Holy Ghost and the power of God has been poured into your soul. You are not the same person you once were. God's grace has transformed you and he's still at trans... In fact, look at verse number 3 and 4. He says that the love of God is perfected. Do you see that word? That word is that carries the idea. It's in maturation. It's maturing. It's in process. I'm not everything I ought to be for God. I'm still learning how to do it. But I'm trying. I'm trying to be obedient. I'm trying to be obedient. Please understand me. It is not your obedience that causes you to be saved. It's your obedience that proves you are saved. It's really good preaching, whether you know it or not. Really, really good preaching. I want you to see something else here. Not only do we know that we are Christians, we, by the life we live, we keep His commandments, but we also walk in His steps. He says that in verse number 6. He says in verse 6, And he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. This word ought in verse number 6, is not option. He's not saying you, you, you should walk like Jesus. No, it's more of an obligation. It is, a, it is that because grace has been given to you, your response to grace is to walk in obedience to Him. Now, I've got a question for you. How is it possible to walk in obedience? How is it possible to walk like Him? The answer is right there in verse number 5 and 6. It's right in front of us. Do you notice in verse number 5 it talks about being in Him? And then in verse number 6, we abide in Him. We don't have the strength in ourselves to be obedient. If you take Jesus out of me, I'm as wicked and sinful and hopeless and helpless as any derelict who's ever been born on the face of the earth. The only good thing about any of us is that He is in us. And the ability that we have to live for His glory doesn't come from us, but comes from His presence within us. It's the, it's the principle of John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. A branch is able to produce fruit only as it abides in the vine. And the only reason I can produce the fruit of righteousness is because my life has been hid with Christ in God. Because I am in Him and He is in me, He is producing from me fruit to His glory and His honor. I cannot do that unless I'm in the vine. And so he makes a strong argument this morning that anybody who says they are saved and yet they constantly live a life of rebellion against God, there is evidence to believe that their salvation is not genuine. Pretty powerful stuff here this morning. Here's the second thing he says. I told you this morning that there would be two markers as to identify those of us who are saved and those who are not. Why does he give us another marker here? Well, the Pharisees could have very well claimed to be keeping the law. But, right, but it's more than just doing what God says. There's something else that has to be involved to give us the assurance of our salvation. We are sure we are saved for two reasons. Number one, we know that we are saved by the life we live. And secondly, we know we are saved by the way we love. Not only by the way we live, 
but also by the way we love. Now let's do a little Bible study quickly, can we? Notice what happens in the text. If you have your text in front of you, notice this clearly. What John does in verse 3, he talks about commandments, plural. He's been talking about the commandments as a whole. But when he gets to verse number 7, he condenses all of the commandments into one singular commandment. He says in verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had or read from the beginning. What is the one commandment that he is calling every Christian to engage in? It is the commandment to love each other. Man, that's been the old commandment, right? It's been around a long time. In fact, look at verse number 7. He said this is a commandment that is old, old, old. It's out of, in the margin of your Bible, right? Leviticus 17, 18. Chapter 17, verse 18. Because there Moses wrote that we're supposed to love our neighbors. And so it is an old commandment. Everybody knows. Why did Jesus condense, or why did John say all the laws are condensed into this one commandment? Paul gives me the explanation in in Romans 13. Watch what Paul says in Romans 13. He says, For the commandments say, You must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and the other commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of God's law. Paul makes the argument that if I have genuine love in my heart, I'll not commit adultery. If I have love in my heart, I'll not steal from my brother. I'll not lie on him. I'll not defraud him. I'll not hate him. I will love him. Now Jesus comes in verse 8. John comes in verse 8. He's been telling us about the old commandment. But now in verse 8, he starts talking about a new commandment. When in reality, he's still talking about the old commandment. If you're not confused yet, hang on just a moment. He says this in verse number 8. I can't tell you how much fun I'm having. Now you may have, you say, I can't wait for him to be done. I'm having a ball. Amen. Watch here. Watch happens here in verse number 8. He says, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true and in him and him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. John says, there is an old commandment that says that you're supposed to love your neighbor. He said, but I'm giving you a new commandment by the Lord himself and the old commandment is taking on a new new shine to it. Let me help you understand this. In John chapter 13, Jesus explains what makes the old commandment new. He says this in verse number 34 and 35, John John chapter 13. Jesus says, "How so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. We already know that's the old commandment, right? But now he's going to add to it. Watch how he adds to it and makes it new. He says, love each other just as I have what? Loved you. He's making a new twist on this. Before, Jesus would tell us, before the old law would say, love your neighbor. You know what the new law says? Also, love your enemy. The old law would say, love people, and then the new law would come around. Jesus would say, just don't love those who love you, but love people like I love them. Love them and don't hold prejudice. Love them and don't hold them to a standard higher than your own standard. Love them like I love them. Brother Ray, what are you getting at this morning? Here's what I'm getting at this morning. The Bible teaches us that a person who is genuinely saved will not only seek to live for the Lord, but will do all they can to love people along the journey. We're not going along the journey criticizing and condemning and putting people down. Mike, we recognize it's hard for everybody. Everybody's struggling somewhere. And so part of my responsibility as a believer in Christ is not only to walk and be obedient to God, but along the journey of life, I'm to try to help my wife and my family and my neighbor, my neighbor who's not saved, that that, that gay couple down the street, that person who's a derelict, I'm to love them and be an example to them so that they might see my good works and glorify my Father which is in heaven. He's telling me the marks of a true Christian, watch the way they live and watch the way they love. If those two things are absent within them, the Bible says that they are lying about their salvation. Don't miss this. Who are they lying to? Well, they're not lying to their family because their family sees them. They're not lying to their co-workers because their co-workers see them every day. They hear what comes out of their mouth and see what comes out of their mouth. You know who they're lying to? They're lying to themselves. 
They're telling themselves that it's okay, that they're going to be okay because they remembered praying a prayer or they remembered going to the baptistry or they remembered how they felt. Even though they don't love the Lord, serve the Lord, walk with God, they somehow think they're going to heaven. I put on Facebook this week a a little ditty by D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody said, if a man's religion can't get him to church on Sunday, why does he think it'll get him to heaven when he dies? If your religion doesn't have any impact on you, it doesn't change the way you think, the way you speak, the way you live. If it's not having an impact, the impact on you is evidence that the Spirit of God is working in you. We all have a long way to go. None of us are perfect. We stumble in our words. We stumble in our behavior. But there ought to be the evident work of the Holy Spirit within me. The Bible says if I hold hatred in my heart toward my brother, then I'm not abiding in the light, but I'm walking in darkness still. Man, I, I, God calls me. I, I've got a cartoon I want to show you this morning from the, from the theologian Linus from the Peanuts cartoon. See if you can identify with this. Linus says, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. Right? I like this little ditty there. A preacher in preacher language, it says this. Preachers love crowds. What we don't like are individuals in the crowd, right? We love, we love crowds. Listen, you know what I want to do? Watch this, and I want to finish up with my thoughts here. When the Lord saved me in the spring of 1978, I'll tell you what, it was glorious. It was at Friendship Baptist Church. Ronnie Owens was preaching. Carl Simmons was the pastor of that church. And I was 17 years old. I was sitting, Travis, about where you are at right there. And God dealt with my heart concerning my sin. I never walked an aisle. I never came forward. But I invited Christ to be Lord and Savior of my life in that moment. And can I tell you how I know that was real? Can I tell you? Can I tell you? Watch this. I know that was real, not only because I felt it, but 40 years later, it's still real. You know what I'm, you know what I'm hanging my hat on? The truth of God's word that my life has been changed. Not because I'm a perfect person. Because the one who knows me best could testify of those things in my life. God still has to develop within me. But I will tell you that from the time the Lord saved me. He put his spirit on the inside of me. And the evidence that his spirit is on the inside of me. Is that when I sin he convicts me. When I wander he draws me. When I'm discouraged he comforts me. When I'm bewildered he teaches me. He's been doing that for four years. 40 years. The Spirit of God is the earnest of my inheritance. It's the down payment. It's the guarantee that He's in me. And because He's in me, it has changed my life. How do you know you're saved? You don't know you're saved because you had a nice fuzzy feeling that came over you. And the hair at the back of my head stood up, brother, right? That's how I know I'm saved. Now, I won't be in church for 52 times out of a year, but I'm saved, bless God. I can go to the lake. I can go fishing. I can do this. But I can't be in church because God don't care if you don't go to church. Shame on you. You, Did you see me getting in the flesh right there? Y'all pray for me. (laughs) Almost almost just decided to preach a message in the flesh and feel good about it. (laughs) Amen. But I am telling you, you guys know this. This is not new revelation to you. You know that if you say you're saved means nothing if you don't live like a saved person. Saved people live like Jesus. Oh, what a good sermon. What a good sermon. Should have ministered, Randy. I want you to minister because I'm about to get into flesh really bad and need to quit. One of the greatest crimes in the United States history is the crime of Confederate. Confederate money, right? Not Confederate, excuse me. What's the word I'm looking for? Counterfeit, thank you. I'm going to talk about the Civil War and I couldn't get Confederate off my mind. You see, I'm really in the flesh, really bad. Help me, Lord. Help me finish up strong. Counterfeit money has been the, uh, one of the greatest crimes in American history. The reason being was uh, for, the, for the better part of the 19th century, every bank had its own currency. It had its own currency. Can you imagine that? It was estimated that by the time of the Civil War, one-third of all currency in America was counterfeit money. It's amazing. In 1863, the United States finally codified or made one currency recognizable across all the states. But the problem was is that people quit making counterfeit bills from the banks and began to make counterfeit U.S. currency. 
And because it was still such a major problem, it wasn't until the day that Abraham Lincoln died in 19 or 1865 that they began to form what was called the United States Secret Service. We sometimes look at those men and women as those whose job it is to protect the president. They were not even in service until after the time of Lincoln. They were initially form, formalized and organized in order to counterfeit, counter, or to counter counterfeit money. That's what they were doing. And so I, I, raise, I raise that situation to you to ask you this question. Are you the real thing or are you a counterfeit? Because I, I don't want you to lie to yourself. If you are the real thing, it's not how, what was your experience. It's what you are experiencing now. It's the walk you have now. It's what you're doing now. Is the Spirit of God at work within you? Is the Spirit of God working through your life? Do you have a love for people? This is not a love that's emotional love, that's based on affection. It's a, it's a biblical love that says, I'm going to be committed to you. That's what biblical love is. I'm committed to you. The emotion part of love comes and goes, but the committed part of love is constant. God continually loves me regardless of who I am. He continually loves me. And so I look at the way I live, and I look at the way I love. And if those things are consistent with God, His Word, His character, then I know that I've been saved by his amazing grace. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth that resonates within us. Father, I would hope that everybody in the sound of my voice is saved. Whether they're here, whether they're listening by way of internet, whether they listen in days ahead just off the website, I don't know. But God, my prayer is that you'll take this word. It'll not return void, but it'll accomplish the purposes for which you have it sent. And Lord, my heart is that those of us who know you by faith, that we'll not, uh, we'll not think that what you're pleased with is a half-hearted life, but a full life lived for your glory. With your heads bowed, head, hearts humble before God, let me ask you this question. How many of you this morning would say, Brother Ray, I'm lost lost. You may be in church, you may come to church, you may be a member of a church, but you know in your heart that you've never been saved. Brother Ray, pray for me. I'm lost and I need a Savior. Would you slip your hand up? I'll not embarrass you. I'll not come to you. I'll not point you out. I'm lost and I need a Savior. If that's you, would you raise your hand right quick and drop it right down? Let me ask you this question. How many of you say, Brother Ray, I know that I'm saved, not just because I, I know it in my heart, but I know that there's also some things in my life that God's been dealing with me. I, I need to demonstrate that salvation more openly, more boldly. I need to be more, I need to walk boldly with God. Would you ask God to help me to be that kind of believer? If that's you, would you hold your hand up and then drop it right down? Thank you. I know that. I know that all over God's house. I'm there. I know it. I know it by experience. I know it. And so, God, I ask for favor to be given to your church today. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit, empty us of ourselves, and Father, use us for your glory. I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Randy's going to lead us in a song of invitation. If you need to come and pray, this altar is open for you to pray. If you need to come and pray for a family member, a friend that doesn't know Christ, would you take advantage of this moment and do that as well? Let's pray before him.